With God, there is always more. More love, more life, more freedom. Welcome to Zoe's Exploring More with Michael Thompson. C.S. Lewis once wrote, Our Heavenly Father has provided many delightful ends for us along our journey, but He takes great care to see that we do not mistake any of them for home. Join me and the team as we explore the kingdom together, discovering the deep truths and offering encouragement for the journey. There is always more. Hey listeners, it's SJ. And like many of you, as 2019 draws to a close, we are preparing for the holidays, celebrating what God has done in the past year. We're praying for guidance and casting vision for 2020. We're having meetings and strategic gatherings to prepare our hearts and our team for what God has planned for us in the next year. During those meetings, a team member brought up that many times people find a podcast, like Exploring More, that they enjoy, but then they don't go back and listen to previous episodes, uh, missing out on some of the great content. So with that in mind, for the next few weeks, we're going to be revisiting our very first series called Being Fathered. We hope you enjoy it, and we'll be back in the studio recording all new episodes of the Exploring More podcast soon. Thank you. Well, welcome back to the Exploring More podcast. I'm Michael Thompson. I'm with my friends uh, Jim Cheney and Tom Benner and S.J. Jennings, and we're talking about being fathered. This is part two of a five-part podcast series on being fathered, and yeah, I wanted to explore a little bit uh, today. Just, Tom, you brought it up last time, the, the role of a father in protecting, providing environments, providing instruction. There's provision and there's protection. And how, how important that is to the, to the heart of a boy or a girl, even, even as a man and, or a woman, you know, as that heart grows, it's still, we still long for uh, provision, protection of, 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 from a good, good father. God is our father. But so much of our story is tied up and wrapped up in how we were fathered and, and what that right. looks like. Um, you know, fatherhood has been under attack for a lot of years, our, our culture, our society. We see the results. Sometimes it takes 10, 15, 20 years later to see the effect of fatherlessness. It was uh, John Eldridge in his book, uh, Fathered by God, that says that the, uh, the, the problem with, with men is that they are unfathered and, and, un, and therefore unfinished. Mm-hmm. You know, so if God is restoring things in us, then there, there's a lot of work that can be done uh, for those things that maybe we didn't get along the way uh, from our fathers. And it's not our heart to, to bash on dads, we're, but we're talking about the significance of being fathered and what would it look like to be fathered by God and to let him take the controls, let him take that space of validating, uh, affirming, warning, protecting, and, uh, and giving that role to him uh, for the rest of our days. Um, you know, back to, back to fathering and, and some of the crisis that, that, that's going on, um, I just ran across a few statistics that, that just was like, whoa, uh, father, about fatherlessness. One in three children in America live without their biological father. One in four live with only a mother. Uh, another, another number about fatherlessness. Um, fatherless children are 63% more likely to commit suicide. Whoa. 60%, 63%, here's what it was, 63% of youth suicides are from hmm. fatherless homes. 90% of all runaways, boys and girls, come from a fatherless home. Mm. Sad. Very sad. Yeah. Yeah, I heard a statistic the other day that said that the number one cause of death of a middle school age student or child is suicide. Suicide. Number yeah. one cause of death of middle school kids. Mm. Wow. Yeah, it's, it, it breaks your heart. I mean, there's more statistics and things, but we're, we're making a case for this is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Being fathered is significant, and the lack of being fathered is clearly significant. And so protection, 
you know, this idea of being uh, protected. Um, I remember when my, when my uh, daughter Ashley, we were, she was probably about four or five, um, we were in uh, one of those kind of small traveling you know, carnival fair kind of things, you know, where the little Shetland ponies are, are hooked up to a, um, kind of a, like a merry-go-round almost, you know, they're just kind of walking in a circle and there's probably four or five horses. We were waiting in line. I mean, she was so excited and so looking at these, these horses, um, you know, they were bigger than her, but they were, they were little ponies. And, and she, the line started moving, but she was kind of mesmerized by the horses and so the line moved a couple, and I'm just kind of watching her. Well, I had shuffled about three spaces, and I'm kind of watching her. She's okay. She takes a step back, and she kind of bumps into a man's leg, and she puts her arm around his leg, <laughs> you know, that she would do for me, to me, you know, comforted. She's just, she's just glad to be there. And then the voice says, well, hey, and she knows it's not my voice. She looks up and is immediately petrified. Uh-huh. Of course. You know, and, yeah. and I'm, I immediately was like, sweetheart, honey, Ash, I'm right here, right here. Come here, buddy. Come yeah. on. Yeah, I'm here. And she, you know, it was just an arresting, you know, couple seconds for her. I don't know that she even remembers it, but, you know, to, to feel protected is, is a beautiful thing. To, to, to feel the, the fear, the, to be scared that I don't know, I don't know this. I don't know what to do here. I don't know this person this this is not my dad you know had a had an effect on her heart do you have any stories of how that might have looked in your life uh, where you were you were caught off guard you were in a moment where yes our fathers were were in the game but not in that moment not in that game does that make sense i'm not i don't understand what you mean where you needed fathering but there wasn't any. Okay. He, he, he couldn't be there. Maybe he was working. Maybe it happened, you know, uh, in, in, in a moment at school or in a moment on the playground or in a moment in a classroom um, where fear comes in, where uh, maybe even shame comes in. One, one thing that comes up when, when you say that, <clears throat> it's not exactly what you're asking for, but I can remember asking my dad, I think... My brother and I were asking him this, that, and I don't even know what the context of the question was, but if you, if, if we were at home and a, and a burglar came in with a gun and, and said, it's either you or the kids, you know, we asked him what he would say. I mean, we want, we mm-hmm. wanted to know. Yeah, it's funny how, that how must, he would how that handle that. Up in your, in your conversation with your brother as a little guy, sure. <laughs> And we knew the answer, but we just wanted to hear it. And of course, he said, "Of course, I would." You know, I mean, we wanted to know that he would protect us. He would right. do anything to protect us. Mm. Um, but I always saw him as really strong and powerful. And I remember um, they had the, he was a t- he was in the t- in the education system, and he was a, t- a, a school teacher. And they had this softball game, and I'll never forget. He just whacked one over the fence, and it was like, "Whoa!" You know, that's my dad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, you know, just realizing how, what a, what a role he had that we looked up to him so much and wanted so much for his attention, which we didn't always get, but, but in in certain settings we did know we were safe and we did know that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jim, you shared last in the last podcast about, um, you know, not realizing some things till later. You know, I I I didn't know how my dad was protecting us by paying all the bills. Right. You know, by, there was gross. Every time I opened that, that refrigerator, there was stuff in there. Always milk. You know, the yeah. Milk, right? yeah. The milkman. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was an occasion yeah. once in a while, you know, it got down low or whatever. And, or, you know, we didn't have any for the morning. We ate, I remember a few dry cereal mornings, but anyway, there was, but there was a protection, a provision in, in how, and how that went. And I think for me, some of the first scary moments that, you know, at, that my dad wasn't there was when, you know, I was in school, gr- you know, grade school. And, um, yeah, the, the bullying, the, the teasing. I mean, there's not a boy or girl who gets through third grade, fourth grade, you know, through elementary school without incidents and, and moments where, you know, it's not they grab the, the wrong leg. There's no leg to grab. Mm-hmm. And, 
and those were my first encounters with some shame and fear. I, th- I felt like something whispered to me that I couldn't tell. You know, I couldn't let my dad know because he would be mad or he would be upset or somehow it was my, it was my fault and it, it just made me, you know, want to hide. Mm-hmm. I remember getting accused of, um, this was probably fifth grade, getting accused of cheating. Well, I, I happen to be in this case, let me make it clear. In this case, I happen to be the one that was being, the paper was being looked at. So I got kind of mm-hmm. roped into the cheating. Now, there's some other incidents I won't talk about. <laughs> but, you know, and it was, it was the idea that, there, you know, we're going to talk to your parents. And, I mean, it was, I think I threw up, honestly. I think that I was so afraid of what was going to happen, you know, that they wouldn't understand. Because it didn't seem like the teachers were understanding. You know, I was being pulled into this. Um, and that, you know, a lot of those stories that you talked about that end up statistically, you know, that we just share. I mean, those are, those are little girls, little boys who grow up afraid and under shame. And there is a absence of, of, of father's presence, protection, provision, words, because we still have that same little heart. Even when we get older, right? We, you said it last podcast, boy, I would love to hear maybe more than I love you. I'm proud of you. Yeah. And so I'm 53 would you love to find a note in your from your dad? Mm. Yeah. Even though we've got two dads in the square here that have passed on and Tom's dad's alive, my dad's alive. But to get that note that I love you, I'm proud of you, I mean it's powerful. Yeah. Huge. It's powerful. Yeah. I wonder too, as we're we're talking about these <coughs> uh statistics about fatherlessness, you know, I wonder the the fathers who left. I wonder what their, what, what their dad, mm-hmm. you know, what their relationship with their point. dad looked like and whether that kind of behavior was passed on. And, you know, because if you're not fathered, if you're not safe, if you're not guided, if you don't have, I think everybody goes into parenting with some level of cluelessness, right? Right. But if, if you don't have any kind of guidance at all, or if what you've been shown is that when things get hard, you leave, then that's what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. When things get hard, yeah, you know, I wonder. You know, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Maybe one of the listeners will email it to us or whatnot. But, yeah. you know what that correlation is like. Well, but, that, that's a there's either that beautiful encouragement or or an honor to say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or that can be a really jab. You know, somewhat of a detrimental sure uh, blow. Sure, you know when when yeah, dad doesn't seem to come through and you you seem to be coming up in his footsteps and that criticism from a family member that can be hard and that can be heavy in, in my case um, alcohol was a huge part of my life in uh, my middle and later teenage years and <clears throat> I, I came to realize that uh, and I'm not blaming him but alcohol was a very huge part of my dad's life and um, as I started to think more about this, I realized that um, his mom died when he was 12, and his dad raised him, and uh, his dad spent a lot of time in bars, and they ate dinner almost every night in a bar. So I'm sure that my dad started drinking very young in those days. Of course, there wasn't much uh, um, uh, prohibition against that or enforcement of that. And then, of course, he spent, his plane was shot down in a war, and before he came home and got married and had me, he spent 18 years in a prison camp. So, you know, if, you, if I look hard enough at it, I can certainly understand um, some of his um, distance and his aloofness and his um, uh, leaning on alcohol. Uh, I, I mean, it doesn't excuse mine, but um, it helps to understand maybe a little bit about where he came from. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, my dad, uh, Jim, you know, he he had some physical challenges. You know, your dad had emotional and, and phys- or psychological challenges, as you're referring to. My dad's physical challenges kept him from being, you know, classically protective. He's not going to get up in the middle of the night if someone comes in the house because it takes him 10 minutes to get out of bed into his wheelchair. So one of the memories I have of being protected in a fatherly way 
uh, came from actually my eldest brother, who's 12 years older than I am. And I remember being nine or 10 years old, my brother and I, um, my, my, I have two brothers, uh, the one who's only 20 months older than I, uh, <clears throat> we were out playing in the neighborhood. And, you know, like you mentioned, there's this kid who, you know, gives us a hard time every time we see him at school or otherwise, and he's, you know, a little ways away. And he had spray painted something on the road about us. I don't remember exactly what the quote unquote slur was, but mm. it was, so we saw that and went back and I, I told my brother about it. And at the time he drove this huge Mack truck. I mean, I don't remember whether he was a tow truck driver or what he was, but it, I just remember it being this gigantic truck, the bulldog on the front and the whole thing. And he, we went back and told him about, you know, the spray painting and what the kid down the street had, had done. And he said, he looked at me with more fury in his eyes than I'd ever seen in another man ever before. And he said, get in the truck. And so we climb up into this thing and we steamed a little one ro lane road neighborhood, <laughs> tiny. And we're, you know, the smoke's coming out of the smokestacks. I mean, he's angry. And we come up in front of this, the air breaks, you know, psh, and he, we just there, there in the truck. And I just see him go and pound on the door, you know, an adult answers the door and he just, you know, kind of laid into this person, whoever it was. I don't remember if it was a man or a woman. And he came back out, you know, got into the truck and he said, you'll never have a problem ever again. You know, and then we went back to the house. I was like, yeah. that was a little overwhelming and a little right. overboard in many ways, I'm sure. But, right. uh, but I remember feeling very protected in that moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I hate to cut in on this now, but let's, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back and continue uh, our stories. Hey listeners, this is SJ. Just wanted to tell you real quick about a cool resource we have available for you. It's a digital audio pass from both the Deepening Weekend for Women that we did back in September and the Heart of a Warrior Encounter for Men that was out in Colorado in September. We create these resources because we know not everyone can make it to the weekend but may want to hear the guiding and the teaching that took place there. And also, folks want to revisit what they heard at the weekend. If you were even there, you may want to re-listen to some of the sessions that were taught. So, if you visit zoe.org forward slash store, you can find the digital audio passes there, both for the Deepening Weekend for Women and the Heart of a Warrior Encounter West. And they're very reasonably priced. And Serena, our engineer for the podcast, has done a great job of editing those down. Each individual session is about the length of the average commute. So it's a great way to kind of soak in this message even while you're commuting during the day. Or to take it away for a weekend and listen to it at your leisure. Either way, I'd encourage you to go and check out this important resource, the Digital Audio Pass for the Deepening Weekend for Women and the Heart of Warrior Encounter West. We hope you'll check it out at zoe.org forward slash store. Welcome back, and uh, let's jump right back into it. You know, something I just remembered, I hadn't thought about this in forever. One of the things that would happen um, when we have a nightmare at night, you know, in the, our bedrooms down mm -hmm. the hall, and... Every time we just yell out, Dad, Dad, you know, and he'd come in there, he'd get out of bed, he'd come in, he'd sit with us, sit by the bed, mm -hmm. even kneel down there and, and just till we went back to sleep. Wow. Yeah. Which was, you know, I, I, I never even thought about that until just now. Yeah. What, a, what a powerful, powerful thing that was. Because, you know, nightmares can be really traumatic oh, sure. for a little kid. Yeah. And, um, and the other thing, too, he um, used to describe his dad's way of fathering him is benign neglect. That was his term that he would use. His hmm. dad was a, um, an educator, PhD, dean of a uh, University of Illinois, you know, had a very high ranking position. And I think my dad wasn't very well seen or um, known by his own dad. And I really think that that, that produced in him an anger, a, a core of anger that would come out in his parenting style, which we experienced quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But I think it was really rooted in just the fact that he wasn't fathered well. 
Right. You know, and we, as we've all done our journeys to, yeah. to explore what happened to us, what, what's our story, and what messages came to us as yeah. we grew up about the father or a father. And so much of that that we've been doing together as friends, journeying in that and praying about it and forgiving and letting go has had incredible effect on how we see God. Yeah. which has opened up so much more to my heart mm-hmm. in, ter- in terms of who God is really. Because yeah. we all project onto, onto right. God the way our Father was, mostly. I think most people do that. And yeah. I know we've discovered that forgiving and, and understanding the story is a big, a big part of learning how, how to forgive is understanding that yeah. story too. Yeah. You're, you're bringing up a real significant how we associate our earthly fathers with the heavenly father authority authority mm-hmm. right and you use the word project projection i mean you know there's some real work to be done in the disassociation yes uh through the experiences that we've had you know we we've, we've we've come to find out and really see how the experience with the experiences that we've had in our lives with being fathered or not being fathered has had a direct relationship somehow with our relationship with the Heavenly Father. And so, you know, there's some real, um, you know, we would encourage all, any and all listeners, you know, to take a, take a look at, at that storyline. And, and you may find some really broken fences. You may find some really shattered places that, that need, you know, need, need God's attention and, um, and to be able to step into that, uh, into that more. I, I had a story about protection that I wanted to give. So, we were living in Southern California as a boy. Um, we'd moved from my birthplace of uh, Oklahoma, and we're out in Southern California. And it's it's the 1969, I think 69, right in there. So that we're was a good year. it was a good year. So we're but we're riding bikes. Lived in an apartment, um, my younger brother and I. And so the the apartment, the way it was set up, and these are orange groves. I mean, this is California back then, and there's orange groves all out there, and and this big orange grove was um, a fence on a, on a long sidewalk. If, you know, when you're little, it could have been four blocks, but it felt like four miles. But we, we would ride our bikes to the playground that was at the other end. So the apartment complex, we were on one end. The playground was on the other end in the park. And you had to drive, you had to ride your bike on this sidewalk. Well, there was a German shepherd on the other side of this fence. And it wasn't always there, but it was there enough that when that German shepherd came to that fence, it I remember it, it would scare the bejeebas out of you. Right. you know, <laughs> yeah. My brother and I were pedaling. You know, we would pedal and just looking over our shoulder, is it coming? Yeah. Is it coming? Is Kojo coming? But when, I, when we went to the park with my dad and he was on his bike, you know, he, he, would, he would get in front of us and put us on his right side. Mm-hmm. He'd say, okay, boys, get into position. And we would get over on the right side. Like, you know, now we're like flying like fighters, you know, with one off the, off the wing. And, and we would be safe. The, the dog would come, but it felt so differently. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like nanny, nanny, nana. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you can't get us. Our dad's here, right? Yeah. yeah. That kind of sense of, of protection, you know, when they're there. Um, when, when we step into Luke, I want to go back to we started this conversation in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is validated. By the Father, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then you mentioned it in the last podcast. I want to go back to that. After that moment of the baptism, the validation, the next chapter starts with, then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, into this battle, into this conflict, into this um, yeah, very intense moment where Satan actually looking for ways in to Jesus's story. He says, if you are the son of God, how do you make that? What, what is that an attack on? And what is that? Um, what does that mean to you when you see that, that transition from validation to then into the wilderness and his it time? It seems to him? be a pretty obvious attack on his identity who yeah. he is. And isn't it ironic that he just heard those affirming words from his father just before that? 
I mean, so how timely was that? Yeah, I'm not sure he's even fully toweled off yet. No. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> his hair might be damp, mm-hmm. you know, as he is led into that, into that space. And, and he's for, for 40 days, he's, he's being tempted. He's being lured. He's being provoked in ways that, you know, we get these three that are the identity ones, if you are. Yeah, I think I think about um, how the enemy comes against us as as humans, and Jesus, you know, when he was here, is fully human, and so it's not all that unexpected that he would, you know, come under fire. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the the reason it's lined up that way, what I think about, is that uh, before we go into a battle, we have to know not only who we are, but whose we are. Sure. Yeah. And Good. that really enables us to then enter into that battle. Because if you if you try to enter it, uh, I have many times, I'm sure others have, enter into a, into a battle and you don't really know either how to fight, what you're fighting for, uh, what the goal is, what direction you should go. You just, it ends up being a mess. But if you're, if you're firmly grounded and you, you know, you know, there comes a time to, to go back to your example of the German shepherd, there came a time, I'm sure, you were able to ride by that dog and not be afraid of it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's largely because your dad gets, you get to a point with, with your dad where it's like, you don't really need my protection in this area anymore, son. Go mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. your own. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a little bit of that happening there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when Jesus goes. Yeah, God he's, is he's saying that with you, him into you, that. I mean, you know, you know, again, it's it's paraphrasing. Mm-hmm. But what I hear, what my heart hears in that moment, and when God says that to me, you are my beloved son, you've got what it takes. Mm-hmm. You know who you are. You know whose you are. Now go and, and yeah. enter into the battle. Yeah, take care of this. You that's can take it. care of this. Yeah, that's good. It's hard to, it's hard for me to, wrap my mind around the fact that um, Jesus needed to be tested so that he would know his identity. I'm not sure that was required. But if we look at Scripture the way I think we're starting to, and we talk about this a lot, is that that's our story too. You know, when you get, Hmm. when you start to get an inkling of, when we get an inkling of who we are and we start taking ground in that area and we start living from that place, I think the the testing or the tempting or the situational um, encounters that we have, it's a validation moment. It's like, yeah, see, see who you are there, see what, see how you handle that. Mm. Um, and this is something I think that happens continually throughout our life is that when we um, take some ground, you know, we talk about the false self a lot. This part of us that's been formed by the world, and when we start taking ground in overcoming that and not being so much of a, a tsunami by it in a situation, we actually have a moment to choose, and that's strengthening something in us that I think is really important. And maybe you know that story is is this, it, we're living in that story. Right. You know, every man is. Yes. Every man, every man, every is. man, whatever every you, woman, it's, whatever it you is, got, whatever you hum- didn't get, there comes a time when, you mm-hmm. know, those, the lies of the enemy. If so, if our hearts were, are made for the validation, the acceptance, the worth, the bestowing, if, if that's what our hearts are made for, that kind of love, right? then you know where the enemy is attacking with dismissing. Mm-hmm. Um, devaluing, shame, guilt, fear. Questioning. Yeah. yeah. And so to take, I love that you said, you know, to take back, you know, lost ground, to be able to go and, and what, what this false self is now at work. You know, I, I, I think back to, yeah, I, the insecurity that, that we can have as a man, it, it plays into the enemy's hands because the answer to the question, do I have what it takes, as Eldridge writes in Wild at Heart, and that we've experienced in our story, do I have what it takes? Somewhere along the line, the answer became by def- a defaulting no. Right. And you're alone, and you don't know what to do, you don't know how to do it, and to come out from under that, or come right. out from that cave, that, mm-hmm. that kind of the darkness that that, that that is prevalent, is is what you're talking about, to realize... No, I, I do. I am God. I'm an image bearer. 
God made me in his image. Mm-hmm. I have value to him. He's redeemed me, is restoring me, and now he's fathering me in learning how. Learning, learning how, how to live that learning way. Learning how to live that way mm-hmm. yeah. uh, through the healing moments and the training mm-hmm. moments. Um, yeah, I, I think this is, a, this is a concept that, you know, we would invite all the listeners to get acquainted with, to get, to take a look at, to see if there is some recovery and restoration for, for them in this very thing that we have found it to be true. It, uh, in that vein, going back to the way that we started this, this particular uh, part of, the, of this discussion about fathers, fathering and being fathered, um, the fatherlessness plague that's really mm-hmm. uh, come over our, our country. You know, I, I think understanding that our dads, whether they were present or whether they were not, are in this very same story mm-hmm. and are facing all the same challenges that we're facing and in many cases have no idea who they are and that they're beloved sons of God. And so, you know, for for anyone that's experienced or is experiencing fatherlessness, you know, that that journey of understanding that leads then to empathy and mm-hmm. compassion is, I think, a very needed one. Yeah, that's it, good. It makes you wonder if we need to rethink how we um, talk to young people or to um, seekers uh, when we say, you know, God loves you incredibly. He loves you like a father. I'm not sure there are too many young people given the statistics you said earlier that, that res- would understand that. Mm-hmm. And it resonates it with resonate like, oh, with great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a yeah. lot. Yeah. 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 Right. I want to read a couple paragraphs from the um, 14-day Heart of a Warrior devotional that uh, SJ, you put on uh, the YouVersion Bible app. It's, uh, it's important to this conversation. It says, um, it's a setup. Because we're meant for such a glorious and weighty love, we are all set up for a fall disappointment, heartache, and rejection. It's a setup because there is an adversary, a great villain in our story, who is hell-bent on making sure we do not know and experience unconditional love. Our stories are full of people, other image bearers, who love him perfectly and conditionally. There are dark forces in every man's story that make sure he feels, hears, and experiences you are alone. Trust no one. Arrange for life and love, validation, acceptance, and worth for yourself. The conditional love moments in a man's life result in his believing, if I could do more of this or less of that, be this or be that, then people would love me. Strategies form and harden in our inmost being and become a system that we operate from. Which is what we were talking about, that false Mm self-structure construct that the world has uh, formed us into, and we've agreed with it and believed it. You know, that's who I am, whether it was a a wounding moment uh, that had a a message, like you just said, that you don't belong. That's a big one. That was a big one for me. You, You say stupid things. I had some wounding moments that in my childhood that really shut down my freedom to express mm-hmm. because I was so worried that it, it wouldn't go well. Yeah. And, and think how, how stilted I, I, I became because of that. And, and yet I will say that the beauty of the gospel and this whole idea of transformation and healing and wholeness and wholeheartedness being available to us through this being fathered by the one who we know knows us intimately mm-hmm. has been there the whole time, understands it all. And I think that once we understood that, it, it, then there's nothing that cannot be overcome mm-hmm. in our past mm-hmm. because um, breaking agreements, breaking vows that were made, these are all tools that we have become very familiar with that, we're, that we see in our own personal lives has mm-hmm. been hugely transformative. So, Yeah. Yeah, Tom, I, I I gotta I gotta say this that there's a that that fathering, fathering really has we've 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 brought these up before we'll keep bringing them up in the next couple of podcasts fathering has, the components of, a presence, right, and words, I mean Jesus even drops a bomb on the Pharisees and says, 
your father, the father of lies, mm -hmm. there's another father, there's another voice, there's another presence mm -hmm. that Jesus acknowledges, this father of lies. And if you believe the lies, it, w it, it hijacks you. Mm -hmm. it, it stilts you. You said stilt, stunts. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it has an effect on you. So to, to invite our listeners to, to move into this exploration of being fathered by God, that's where we want to go in the next mm -hmm. few podcasts. That's where we want to share some more. Um, because Billy Graham had just in, passed away just a, a few months ago in reverence to him, I, I got a Billy Graham quote about fathering. He says, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. You know, we started with, we started mm -hmm. with, with the statistics. And Billy Graham himself, is, if you've seen any of the documentaries, he said, if I could do one thing, I would have been gone less and been with my family, with my kids more. Yeah. And we know what kind of life he led. And so this, this, is, this is a hard job, fathering. And we're going to talk in the next podcast about how we have been fathered. And now we're going to transition soon and talk more about fathering. What does it look like? And how God, how's God fathering us as we father? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. look right. forward to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be good. A lot of confessions, I think, going on. <laughs> <laughs> so we look forward to next time. Amen. Yep. Amen. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Exploring More. The landing page for this podcast is zoe.org forward slash podcast. That's Z O W E H dot org forward slash podcast, where you can find the show notes and various platforms to which we broadcast. You can also find us and the life of more by visiting Zoe on Uversion Bible app, Right Now Media, our Facebook page, and Zoe on Instagram and Twitter. Remember, with God there is always more, and you were made for more. Mm -hmm.